a lot of technology has gone into uh, NVS1. Uh, um, uh, thankfully, it is indigenous technology. Thankfully, we now have indigenous atomic clocks, space grade atomic clocks that have been built by uh, the Space Application Center of ISRO, which is located in Ahmedabad. And then you now have academic institutions uh, in India, universities, mm -hmm. as well as private companies who are gearing up to develop atomic clocks, as well as uh, all the spin-off technologies that come along with it. Mm -hmm. Hello and welcome to the GIST on Strat News Global. Good evening, I'm Surya Nadran and welcome to another edition of the GIST where we are focusing on the launch by the Indian Space Research Organization of the Navigation Satellite Second Generation Series. This is the first satellite of its kind. We expect more will go up. Uh, which will form up the um, Indian uh, satellite navigation system called NAVIC. My guest is Chaitanya Giri, editor of Interstellar, our uh, sister uh, space uh, website. Uh, Chaitanya, glad to have you again. Thank you. Happy to be here. Chaitanya, this uh, latest launch, um, just let's give our viewers a sense of how important is it and uh, how does it augment our own indigenous uh, navigation capabilities vis-a-vis -vis GPS? You know, for any country, positioning, navigating, and timing, uh, which are collectively known as the PNT systems, are quite important. And this is not a modern phenomena. You've seen in the past, timekeeping has been the prerogative of kings yeah. and the courtiers yeah. uh, of the kings and the uh, uh, emperors. So, timekeeping is very necessary for strategic systems. Uh, timekeeping is very necessary for people who work 9 to 5, especially on stock markets, because uh, the the time that you invest the money in yeah. and the price that you pick up for that particular time, for that particular moment, is very crucial. Mm. It shouldn't be the case that you buy something at a higher price and then you get a lower price for it. Yeah. Mm. So, so or, or, or a, you know, a higher price is appreciated, but you don't need a lower price. Mm. So, even for that, PNT systems are extremely crucial. So, not just military, but also for running a national economy or for running stock exchanges, a PNT system is especially, uh, you know, important. Now, India hasn't had a PNT system very early. We've been uh, so-called second-generation uh, PNT system holders. The first generation was, uh, you know, dominated by the Americans and the global positioning system. Mm -hmm. So much so that uh, GPS has become synonymous with PNT systems. So people call Navic, or they have been calling Navic over the past few years as India's GPS. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's not that. It is India's PNT system. So that's the accurate word to be used. So why G uh, GPS got famous? Because firstly, uh, pioneers' advantage. They started very early. Yeah. Uh, secondly, GPS became very crucial when American forces began going expeditionary. Um, so during the uh, the uh, the Afghan war of the 80s, the collapse of the Soviet Union, the Kuwait War, yeah. then the Afghan operations in Operation Desert Storm, uh, 2001, uh, War on Terror. So all these things really kept the momentum going for GPS for strategic applications. Mm -hmm. At the same time, uh, the New York Stock Exchange, the NASDAQ, these have been very crucial uh, uh, sort of stakeholders or end users of the GPS system. Mm -hmm. So GPS... All these years, it has been providing services to two types of customers. So, a slightly inaccurate, I won't say very inaccurate, but a slightly inaccurate service is provided to the low-end users, which are non-strategic applications. Mm -hmm. uh, but for strategic applications, which also includes the stock exchanges, mm -hmm. uh, it is the more precise service. Mm -hmm. So, that has been the case. We've heard stories about uh, India not getting access 
uh, yes, yes. to the GPS during the Kargil war, yeah. where we wanted to find out the hideouts of the terrorist groups that were occupying high positions. So that was when we decided Navik should come in. Um, I'm glad that today we are seeing the second generation of uh, uh, Navik satellites, which have been now renamed mm. as NVS-1. And it is the first of the next, uh, there'll be a few more seven uh, odd satellites to be launched in the coming few months. And as uh, ISRO chairman Somnath recently said that uh, we'll have a launch every month. Mm. And what I uh, actually now try, I'm trying to decipher is that uh, you count in these many remaining Navic satellites. Yeah. Yeah. Then you have the Chandrayaan, then you have the Gaganyaan mission, then you have the Aditya L1. And cumulatively, there will be a, uh, the other few uh, remote sensing missions uh, lined up. So overall, the launch you know, sort of schedule looks quite busy for ISRO. Uh, and in this launch schedule, we are also trying to graduate the NAVIC system. So the previous NAVIC system was using atomic clocks, mm -hmm. which are necessary to provide that accurate timing. And we were procuring these uh, atomic clocks from some European uh, uh, vendors. Mm -hmm. So atomic clocks were not made in India. At least the space-grade atomic clocks were not made in India. We've been making atomic clocks for quite some time. Uh, here in Delhi, uh, you have uh, the National Physical Laboratory, uh, which is run by the CSIR. It has been working on atomic clocks since uh, yes. independence. Nearly yeah. independence, yeah. Uh, uh, precision clocks, they later on got the name of atomic clocks. Mm -hmm. uh, we have been at it, we have been working uh, on those lines, but the space grade atomic clocks are a bit different. They are highly miniaturized. Um, they have to work in that sort of environment which is hostile to oh, any electronic mm -hmm. equipment. Uh, yet at the same time, it has to be, uh, it has to be of lower mass of lower weight mm -hmm. because you can't lift that much weight as you can uh, as you would require for a atomic clock which is built here for earthly applications so a lot of water has flown a lot of technology has gone into uh, nvs1 uh, well, uh, thankfully it is indigenous technology thankfully we now have indigenous atomic clocks space grade atomic clocks that have been built by uh, the space application center of isro which is located in Ahmedabad. And then you now have academic institutions uh, in India, universities, mm -hmm. as well as private companies who are gearing up to develop atomic clocks, as well as uh, all the spin-off technologies that come along with it. Mm -hmm. uh, especially atomic clock uh, uh, compatible semiconductor chips. And so on and so forth. So we are getting there. Uh, this is actually a sort of a walled garden of technologies mm -hmm. where you build a wall first. Atomic mm -hmm. clock is the wall. And a host of other technologies will come around it. And not only technologies, but applications will come around it, which will be entirely in our control because mm -hmm. the clock is indigenous. And uh, the uh, launch vehicle used was the uh, GSLV, uh, which means the cryogenic engine. So uh, that technology has matured, you would say? It, it is maturing with every launch. Uh, see, uh, for any system of systems, a rocket is a system of systems. Yeah. There are quite a few components, or there are thousands of components there. And uh, every group of scientists uh, working on a one single rocket is looking after one single system or yeah. a group of systems there. So those who have been working on cryogenic systems, uh, they have sort of uh, gotten control over it. Uh, the leash is in their hands now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are now in an era where uh, we'll start playing with these cryogenic engines. Mm -hmm. We'll make them smaller, we'll make them bigger. Uh, the heavy lift launches that are to come up, uh, uh, the the current heavy lift launcher is LVM-3. Uh, then there will be something known as the next generation launch vehicle. All these will use semi-cryogenic, cryogenic engines uh, in a big way. Mm -hmm. And the experience that we accrue with GSLV Mark II or GSLV Mark III right now 
will help us further uh, develop cleaner fuels. Mm-hmm. You know, the entire idea of semi cryogenic is that you want to really lift heavy weight. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, weight that is not uh, precisely possible with solid fuel rockets. Mm-hmm. Or you you don't really want to carry that much liquid fuel, yeah, yeah. that much liquid fuel when you're lifting something which is about ten tons. Mm-hmm. So for that semi cryogenic cryogenic engines are extremely important. We are going there, and the other aspect is which is now coming up in a big way, and that is sustainability, where uh, there is a growing emphasis on discarding solid fuels mm-hmm. and opting for cleaner fuels. So it is not just about electric vehicles and hydrogen fuel cell vehicles yeah. here on Earth, but it is also about discarding the solid fuel uh, uh, launch vehicles and replacing them with rockets that are using cleaner fuels. Mm-hmm. So like uh, methalox is one uh, fuel, then cryogenic fuels are of course very clean because they're just, uh, uh, you know, really cool uh, hydrogen and oxygen mm-hmm. uh, and so on and so forth. So there are the fuels which are in the making. So, uh, again, that's an entirely different story from NVS-1. Mm-hmm. But uh, the beauty of this mission is that uh, there's so much happening in terms of indigenization. Atomic clocks, we did not have it as of now. We are mastering over it. Um, cryogenic engines. Cryogenic engines. It has been a tough ride for us. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, so <laughs> we're getting there. And uh, with more and more mission... What I believe is we'll uh, get into the nitty gritties of these, you know, high end technologies. We'll make them better. We'll uh, outdo a few countries around us mm-hmm. uh, while we make them better. And uh, that's the crux of, you know, advancing in terms of technologies. Mm-hmm. But the advance has been slow, mm-hmm. would you say? Because uh, Navic itself is. Uh, in a fairly early stage. Navic is in fairly early stage, so if you compare it with the GPSs, mm. the Europeans have been asking India. For Navic? No, not for Navic, but they were quite keen, uh, especially European Union. Mm-hmm. It has been quite keen that India develops its uh, positioning, navigating, timing system, PNT system, uh-huh. along with them. So, uh, there were talks some 15 years ago where the Galileo system which they eventually built yeah. uh, was supposed to be built along with India. I see. Well, it didn't culminate because we realized that we have to take the long uh, solitary path yeah. the Ekla Chalo Re mm-hmm. and we did that and I'm glad we did that because um, if you look at uh, some other examples that Europe is now struggling with uh, it doesn't have a fifth generator fight, uh, generation fighter aircraft. Uh, but they're developing something. They're developing something, but they're late to the party. True. Mm-hmm. Whether, whereas Europe should have built a fifth generation fighter aircraft much earlier. Yeah, true. Yeah. So a lot of dependencies is what they've accrued. They've, they're now dependent heavily on China uh, with respect to trade, with respect to market. They're very much dependent on America with respect to security. So, we didn't want to be in that situation. And that's the reason why it took us a bit longer, but we have indigenous technology at hand right now. Mm -hmm. And there are Indian companies, there are Indian academic and scientific institutions, there are Indian strategic institutions, which are taking note of these technologies. And uh, I am sure that there will be a nice ecosystem building out especially of downstream applications. So, for instance, the first generation Navic that you saw, uh, the Indian government made it mandatory for it to be used in all the government-led programs. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, uh, the Indian railways, uh, the engines, uh, they use Navic system. Otherwise, if you remember an era where trains, especially during winters, they used to ply late yeah. because of fog. Always, yeah. Always, yeah. And uh, there, you know, the 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 control and command station of the Indian Railways used to be unaware yeah. where the train is. 
so to get over that uh, the end users indian railways was made an user mm-hmm. uh, the the road and transport ministry is a big end user of course ministry of defense is a big end user and uh, more recently when india started assembling uh, phones mm-hmm. in india mobile phones in india we made sure that uh, some of the chip manufacturers uh, that have been supplying chips for our mobile phones we made sure that these companies build chips that are compatible with navic mhm so these are not indian companies these are not indian semiconductor companies these are american companies but uh, we made sure that they make chips that are compatible with navic because if you have to sell navic yeah you need to the, your mobile phone yeah. mm-hmm. you need the chips that go into it to be using mm-hmm. navic or to so, be compatible with navic mm-hmm. so this is a two or three year old phone it wouldn't be compatible with navic it should be two or three years it should be i mean uh, all the phones that have come after let's say 2018 2019 eh, okay yeah. are more or less uh, especially the android phones mm-hmm. they are more or less uh, compatible with uh, uh, navic systems okay so we are talking about strategic applications and we are talking about which are niche the market is small yeah but we are also talking about the enormous you know market base scope yeah yeah which is there for uh, you know commercial applications of navic so from your zomato to your your your, your swiggy your netmed your 1mg mm-hmm. so there are huge commercial are, yeah commercial there's huge commercial implications for this mm-hmm. we're looking at a billion uh, co- i mean yeah, business yeah, hundreds of billions of dollars right so that's why pnt is the elusive technology that every country wants because it opens up an enormous market mm-hmm. a domestic market and if you really have a technology that can go global then it opens up uh, access to international markets gps has done that for itself so gps has earned enormous revenue for the united states all these years uh and with growing competition now to the gps mm-hmm. in terms of uh, the russians have the glonass uh, the chinese have the baidu yeah. uh, then uh, we have this uh, galileo is what i spoke of uh, then gnzss the japanese have it uh but the other ones are not very well known the japanese one you mentioned you know even galileo hmm. is uh, is it that um, are they that strong are they that networked like gps see again gps got uh, the pioneers advantage as i said and it went global right from the very beginning okay mm-hmm. whereas some of these systems uh, remained regional so i r nss the earlier name for navi yeah, yeah and the earlier name for now nvs was or is regional so if you look at the areas in which it operates uh, it spans from the eastern seaboard of africa mm-hmm. so the indian ocean coast of africa so down south to let's say madagascar mm-hmm. it goes up to perth then it goes up to okinawa islands yeah. roughly uh southern japan and so on and so forth that's a huge area that's a huge area but it's not global mm-hmm. so you have to go global but for going global you need a rationale for going global mm-hmm. and uh, i believe one of the rationales of going global would be that number one india is wanting to be a voice of the global south mm-hmm. so that could be one rationale it's a foreign policy rationale yeah yeah um mm. uh, if you really want to ensure security of your maritime trade and our maritime trade uh, you know pathways are really wide yeah mm-hmm. and it will get even wider so to ensure security of your trade routes you will need an indigenous uh, navigation system mm-hmm. that is global and not regional and not limited to one ocean mm-hmm. the strategic implications you mentioned the armed forces are using the indigenous uh, gps um given that we um, we seem to be replacing the older variant of the navigation satellites with the newer lot does that imply a break in service or is there some backup of some kind 
So there is backup of some kind. So it's not a break in service. It's a, actually a continuation of service. So once we have all the second generation satellites lined up, it will sort of seamlessly integrate, pass on to the pass on the service from the first generation to the second generation, or okay. co-work or co-function. Nothing has been revealed yet. This is my conjecture, uh, because uh, some of these things are kept uh, yeah deliberately yeah. deliberately uh, people remain quiet mm -hmm. and they should be I mean it's justified, but uh, they'll make sure that uh, there's no break in services. But yes. Uh, it was in the news uh, some time around 2018 when the previous generation uh, Navic satellites, the first generation, uh, the atomic clocks on them, uh, they broke down. So we mm. don't want to come across that situation <laughs> once again. Mm. And even if they break down, you should be able to diagnose what exactly led to that situation. Yeah. Mm. And for that very reason, ISRO took upon itself that they'll build the atomic clocks. Mm. Do you see this thing, um, I mean, we know of ISTRO, um, uh, you know, handing over a lot of its projects and work to the private sector. You see this atomic thing too, uh, transitioning to the private sector? Partly yes, partly no. So, uh, so, the commercial sector will be very much interested in procuring something that is viable, and something that is less accurate also. Mm -hmm. So that is something that will pass on, that will be passed on, or the previous generation. When I say less accurate, the previous generation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But whatever is at the bleeding edge will remain with ISRO. Okay, the cutting edge stuff will be yes, which will be strategic. Yes, it will remain with ISRO. Mm -hmm. It will remain with the strategic scientific agencies of India. Okay. And uh, the reason for it is. Uh, it has been so everywhere in the world. Yeah, true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, launch vehicles. You mentioned cryogenic engines that uh, ISRO has developed over years. These are going to be, these are seen as a strategic asset. Obviously, they are. But do you see them being uh, commercialized in that sense for the private sector to use? Launch vehicles? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So, eventually, see, they, there have been talks where the PSLV, uh, has been regularly mentioned and this has been mentioned by ISRO itself that it will eventually be passed on to the private sector mm. fully. That is yet to happen uh, but whenever that happens uh, that step will be welcomed by all. And there are contenders for it and these contenders they are not new to PSLV. They have worked on the PSLV system for ages now. Yeah. They have been with ISRO forever. Ages, yeah. Forever. So, it is just that uh, they've been building certain components and, and these companies will come together eventually to build the entire system. Now, PSLV again is a bygone era system. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. It is proven, it is workhorse, but it is still a bygone era system yeah. now. You have to now update it. Mm -hmm. And that's why uh, there are attempts to build something known as the next generation launch vehicle, which is a modular system, mm -hmm. uh, which is an expendable system. It can be... Uh, it can carry smaller satellites, it can carry bigger spacecrafts and whatnot. Uh, but uh, that is in the works right now. So we are at least 5 to 10 years away uh, from the next generation launch vehicle. But until then, uh, what I feel is uh, the older generation rockets, they need to be given to the private sector mm. uh, for sure. Mm. Uh, and I see a situation where, uh, just like the Americans have, uh, they have a coalition of... Uh, something known as United Launch Alliance. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that United Launch Alliance is uh, in partnership with uh, two of the biggest uh, American mm. space contractors. So I believe that India should go that way. It should have space contractors. Mm. And by space contractors, I mean private sector companies that are behemoths in space. Yeah. You need those kind of players. There has been great emphasis on startups all this while, but startups alone won't be yeah. able to take you up there. You need the big conglomerates of India to come up and pick up uh, these strategic technologies. They might be from the bygone era, mm -hmm. but at least, but they're still usable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, last question: Looking ahead at the rest of this year, what do you expect to see? So, July is quite busy, it seems. So, as has been uh, regularly mentioned, uh, not yet formally, 
um, but uh, July is when the Chandrayaan 3 will be launched. You have the Aditya L1 Solar Observatory, a solar telescope which is placed in the uh, in the outer space that is to be launched. That mission has been long pending, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I'm sure all the uh, solar physicists yeah. <laughs> who have been associated with that mission will be really happy to see it fly and start operations. Uh, that is one. Gaganyan, you've seen the news. Uh, the Navy is uh, has taken charge of testing the. Uh, the capsule, yeah, mm. uh, and the way it lands on the waters, yeah. Mm. Uh, so a lot of tests are happening, and Gaganyan is again in the works. Uh, so you will see it's a busy year. Uh, there's a lot happening. Uh, there are a lot of you know uh, developments on the space economy front. Our uh, Indian space companies are becoming uh, sinusure of eyes. Mm -hmm. We have the Space Twenty meeting. The Space Economy Leaders Meeting happening in uh, July again, and this is and this is part of the G20. So this is where uh, heads of space agencies of all these 19 countries will come together. They'll gather in Bengaluru, and together they'll chart uh, global space policies and global space policies that will endure mm -hmm. for the next few years. So. Right from space diplomacy to space technology to internal space policy to space security to space strategy, we're working on all fronts. Um, and that's why uh, I'm actually quite glad that we've started this uh, venture yeah. for Interstellar because there's a lot to cover, there's a lot to analyze. Um, and um, I hope uh, the country benefits from all this uh, that we are doing. Fascinating, uh, Chetan, as always, you know, space is one really fascinating uh, arena. So thanks very much and glad you could find the time to sit with us and talk about this. Thank you. Uh, that's all we have for you tonight on The Gist. Uh, do subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on social media and Twitter. Thank you and good night.